want to give Jesus one more praise in this place tonight. Woo. Come on. I see Africa praising him back there. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many are feeling good in the house of the Lord tonight? Are you blessed? Wow. What a night it has been. And uh, what, what, a, what a great group of people that are here tonight. I sense a little nervousness here this evening. I sense that in you. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you nervous? Oh, you look nervous. Amen. You look nervous. You look like, I, I don't know what's going on. Well, I'm a little nervous too. But it's a good kind of nervous. It's, it's a blessed kind of nervous. It's a grateful kind of nervous. It's a loving kind of nervous because Mama Julie is in the house here tonight. Come on, help me thank the Lord for our mama. I wish you'd preach tonight. I don't know what I'm doing up here. Uh, we think we're so grateful for her, aren't we? We're so grateful for her and Pastor Sonny. We love them so much. And this has been a heavy month. What an emotional month it has been. I came here tired tonight. I'm like, God, give me power to preach. I am drained. It's been a lot of highs, a lot of emotion, especially on Sunday. Uh, wasn't that a powerful service that we had? And I just sat back and was so blessed. And I'm just so grateful for all of you. And I'm mostly grateful for our founders for, uh, you know, the calling of God upon my life is because of their obedience and the fact that they were obedient to the calling of God on their life. And, and because they were obedient, how many all of us are here today? And I'm so grateful for how God has used them and continues to use them. And on Sunday, you know, I was just so grateful to be able to uh, be asked to, to answer the call to eldership. And it's a, uh, it's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. Everybody's been telling me, how do you feel? How do you feel? And I turn around and tell them, well, how do you feel? I don't know what are you talking about? How do I feel? <laughs> how do you feel? I, you know, I don't know how I feel. All I know is that, you know, I've dedicated my life to the Lord, and I've, and I've dedicated my life to the ministry of Victory Outreach, and I've dedicated my life to follow my pastors all the days of my life. And I'm grateful for them. And I'm in San Diego because of them. Amen. And uh, it's just so great having you here tonight. We love you so much. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles this evening, I'm going to ask you to open up to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. And just remain standing for the reading of the word. Um, it's been a very heavy month. Uh, we started out with the new year. We, we partied, it, partied and brought in the new year. Had a great time. And then our first service, we paid off our building. And wasn't that awesome? And, and to be a part of a church that is debt-free and paid off the building, you know, no one can kick us out of here. We own, we own every, everything you see in this building, we own it. See that little table with the water on it? It's paid for. Can I hear an amen? See those congas? Pray, paid for. Chairs, paid for. The entire building is paid for. Amen? Every screw, every wire belongs to us. Can I hear an amen? amen? And we're grateful. We celebrated that. We burnt the mortgage. And then, you know, we went into, uh, from there, went to Mexico. And what a week we had in Mexico with our founders. A time of direction, a time of vision. I'm going to be sharing some things with you tonight that I shared over there. And then also came back and got right to work again uh, just yesterday. I was uh, in, in, the Ch in Chino in the Mother Church, and, and first I was in Riverside, and I was meeting with our new regional pastor, Pastor Miller, our new regional pastor. And we had lunch with him and also with Pastor Dell. And how many of you love Pastor Dell? And uh, we're strategizing. We want to continue to grow our multi region, we want to continue to grow uh, the, the churches that God has entrusted us with. We're working together very closely. And we're talking about not only growing our churches, but raising up leadership that we could send all over the world. And then in the evening, we were there at the Mother Church, and we were meeting with Pastor Sonny Jr. and also Debbie. 
and a team, and, and we're meeting on some exciting things coming ahead. So stay tuned. Uh, we're working hard for the Lord. And I want to say this to you. There's no greater work than the work of the Lord. There's no greater work. Look at Jamie and tell him, there's no greater work than the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord is exciting. Isn't it exciting? Praise the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 10, familiar scripture says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived. And they stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Tonight, I want to talk to you about how to raise an army. And I want you to also look at the book of Isaiah, if you could. Our promise scripture, Isaiah chapter 54. I was reading it today in the, in the Amplified. I'd never read it in the Amplified. And you know the scripture well. It says here, it says, enlarge the place of your... Well, let me read it in the Amplified. I'm over here reading it in the New King James. What am I doing? It reads this way, enlarge the side of your tent to make room for more children. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling and do not spare them. Lengthen your tent ropes and make your pegs or your stakes firm in the ground. And then it goes on in verse 13. This is the part, or it says, for you will spread out to the right and to the left and your descendants will take possession of nations. It says, and you will inhabit deserted cities. Now go to verse 13. This is the part that really stuck out to me, and I want to read it to you. Look at this here. Look at this verse here. Look how powerful. It says, and all your spiritual sons will be disciples of the Lord. That's powerful. That's powerful. All of your spiritual sons how many and daughters will be disciples of the Lord, and great will be the well-being of the your sons and daughters. Tonight, I wanted to take a few moments to talk to you on the subject of how to raise an army. Before you see it, give your neighbor a high five and tell them it's going to be good tonight. And go ahead and be seated. How to raise an army. That's a big title, huh? Is that not a big title, how to raise an army? Well, how many know God's given us a big task as well? In, in, the, in, the, in the scripture that we read here in Ezekiel chapter 37, the Bible tells us that Ezekiel, he, he preached to dry bones. And when he did that, the bones assembled and they rose up as an army. But how many know they weren't an army for their own purpose? But how many know that they rose up with a very specific and powerful purpose because they were the army of God? And how many know that we also are the army of God? Every time we come into the house of the Lord, how many know we don't just come in here to get blessed, but how many know we come in here also to reach our marching orders? Can I hear an amen? amen. We are the army of the Lord. We are the army of victory outreach. And how many know as the army of victory outreach, God has also given us our very own special task as well. And I was, I was reading this. I thought to myself, man, it sure does sound easy to raise an army. Imagine just preaching just being able to get you all together and just preach to you every week. And that would be the way for the army to rise up. That, that doesn't seem too difficult. But we know this, that raising up an army is much more difficult than just preaching to people. I mean, could say amen. It's much more difficult than just getting together every week and just preaching and inspiring people. To raise an army, it takes much more than that. I was recently reading... Uh, about World War One, I. I love to read about history. How about you? And I was reading about World War One. They called it the Great War. And it went on about how the United States needed to stir up a patriotic response to the war in Europe in order to stop Germany from taking over Europe and then ultimately maybe even taking over the world. So the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, commissioned a famous artist by the name of James Montgomery Flagg to draw an image that would unify and solidify the identity of the United States while also recruiting young men into the army to fight. The caption said very famously, as you know, I want you. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I want you. 
And we know that the image on that painting is the image of who? The image of Uncle Sam. But here's something that you may not know. To find the right person to use as a model for Uncle Sam was difficult for Flag. He was commissioned by the president to draw this picture. He needed to, write, to find the right face. He needed to find the right image so that he could present this to the president and possess, pre present it to the country, but it was very difficult to find the right image. So what I found out is that in the end, James Montgomery Flagg, the artist, used his own face for Uncle Sam. That every time you see that poster that says, I want you, everybody do that, say, I want you. You are looking at the face of James Montgomery Flagg. You are looking at the very artist who used his own image to recruit people into the army. And when I, when, I, when I heard that story, when I read that story, it actually began to speak to me. Because one thing I realized is this, is that if you want to raise up an army for God, you have to get personally involved. You've got to put your own life on the line. See, one thing I've learned in ministry, one thing I've learned in life, no matter what you're doing, whatever you're pursuing tonight, you can never ask people to do something you are unwilling to do yourself. I believe that we need some people who are going to be willing to lay their life down for what they believe. We need some people who are willing to put their own life on the altar of sacrifice. See, when you think about our ministry, after 51 years of ministry, I tell you now, we would not have got to where we were today if there was not a generation that was willing to lay their life down for what they believe. If there was not that first generation, not only Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie, but many of their spiritual sons and their spiritual daughters who were willing to lay their life down on the altar of sacrifice, how many know we would not be here today? I thank God for them. And I thank God that they set a pattern for many of us who began to follow them. You see, this first generation was willing to lay their life down in the ministry. And this has been the pattern for many of us who also answered the call to go. I think back to when Georgina and I answered the call to go to the training center. It wasn't difficult. It wasn't difficult. Terry neighbor, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't. It did, I, I didn't have to, you know, fast for three weeks. <laughs> I didn't have to go into to Prayer Mountain and lock myself in a cabin for a month. I didn't have to do it. The day Pastor Sonny asked me to the go to the East Coast, I immediately said yes. I was ready because that's what Victory Outreach was all about at that time. That was the pattern to find leaders, to find people, to find young people who would be willing to lay their life down for what they believe. Can I hear a good amen? amen. We were willing to do it because that's all we saw in the ministry. That was the norm for our generation. But what about today? What about today? What's going on with this generation? What's happening with your generation? What's happening with you tonight? You ain't saying nothing to me. Ask your neighbor, what's happening with you? I love what the great activist Cesar Chavez, I know some of you go around, you love Cesar Chavez, your brown beret and all that. But I love what he said, he said, to be men is to suffer for others. Lord, help us be men. That's my question. This is a strong message for a Wednesday night, huh? Like, ooh, Pastor, you can't pack and eat tonight. That's right, because this is serious business. Can I hear an amen? So here's my question. Where are the men of God? God bless four of you. Where are the men? Maybe they're all upstairs meeting with the gang. Maybe there ain't no men of God here. Maybe they're all being prepared upstairs. Where are the men of God here tonight? Where are the mighty men of valor here tonight willing to lay their life down for the call? Where are the women of God in this place? No, no, you can't just make noise. Where are the people that are willing to lay their life on the altar of sacrifice, willing to pay a price for what God did in their life, willing to answer? The, is there anyone in Victory Outreach San Diego tonight that says, Lord, you can use me. I am a part of the army. I'm called to be on the front lines of the ministry. We need men and women who are willing to lay their life down 
for the hurting people of this world. See, I want to tell you what every army needs. Number one, write this down. Every army needs a cause. When Eliab scolded his brother David about going down to the front lines of the battlefield, David said, you know, they said, you're coming down for the wrong reasons. You're coming down just to show off. You're coming down here just to make an appearance. Come on, somebody. You're coming down here just take, to take a selfie for your Instagram. Can I hear an amen? And, and David looked at him and says, listen, brother, you don't know. Come on, somebody. That I've had a shepherd's field experience. You don't know that I know what it is to take care of my father's sheep. You don't know that I know what it is to fight the lion and to defeat the lion. You don't know that I know what it is to fight the bear and to defeat the bear. And I defeated the lion and I defeated the bear. And as I look at this Philistine calling out the army of God's people, he will fall just like the lion. He will fall just like the bear. Is there not a cause? Is there not a vision? Is there not a purpose? Is there not a destiny? See, every, every, every army needs a cause. Every army needs a mission, needs something worth fighting for. What I love about David, and, and I know many of us identify with David, but what I love about David is that David was not afraid to fight on the front lines of the battle. How many of you say, I'm on the front lines? I'm on the front lines of the battle, man. I'm fighting for my family. I'm fighting for my marriage. I'm fighting for my unsaved children. I'm fighting in prayer. I may not be preaching, Pastor, but I'm praying in the midnight hour. I'm fasting for their salvation. Come on, somebody. Some of you are even giving of your finances. You're, you're giving of your tithes. You're giving of your offerings. You're giving of your united we can. You're willing to hit the streets. You're willing to open up a, a city life group. You're willing to go into Donovan State Prison. You're willing to go into the hospitals. You're willing to go into the... Is there anyone here that says, I'm on the the front lines of the battle pastor I know that there's a cause I know that there's a vision you see in order to raise an army we've got to be willing to personally sacrifice for what God has shown us that's my question Victor Outreach San Diego this year what has God sh shown you what has he revealed to you about your life what have you been hearing from God in the prayer closet you've been praying but what are you hearing what are you hearing from the Lord? Are you hearing the Lord say, I want to use you? Are you hearing the Lord say, I want to anoint you? Are you hearing from the Lord say, I want to give you a double portion of my anointing? I've called you to go to, to, to answer my call. Come on, talk to me now. Help me preach. See, we need to personally sacrifice. That's why when we begin to transmit the vision, and how many know it's important to transmit the vision in our church? How many know that we can never get tired of hearing vision? Yeah. How many of you get tired of hearing vision? Don't raise your hand now. Wow. Because if you're Victory Outreach, is Victory Outreach in the house tonight? Yeah. Then how many know we never get tired of hearing the vision? Because when we begin to preach the vision, there's a stirring that begins to happen within our hearts. When we begin to take what the Lord has put inside of us and we begin to take this vision and we begin to transmit this vision into you, there's a hunger, there's a stirring, there's an excitement, there's a fire. Come on, somebody. There's a fresh wind that begins to fill this place. It's not only that we preach the vision, but it's that we live the vision. When you take someone who's preaching the vision and mix it with the same person who's living the vision, then how many know that's when a generation will rise up to answer the call? Come on, somebody. Here's what I want to say to this church here tonight. You can't just talk about it. You need to be about it. <laughs> I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. You were, you, you, you were like that in the neighborhood, weren't you? Hey, brother, are you down? Don't just talk about it. Be about it. Do you got my back? Don't just talk about it. Be about it. Well, I got the same word for you tonight. Don't just talk about the vision. Be about the vision. Come on, somebody. Mix your word with your lifestyle. See, we, we, we have a challenge. And the challenge is that many of this generation, God's anointed now generation, possibly even in our church tonight, they're not answering the call. They're gearing their life more towards making money. They're gearing their life more towards college. Now, I'm not saying those things are bad. I, I tell you, tell your kids, go to college. I tell your kids, you know, make a good living, educate yourself, prepare yourself for what God has. 
But let me tell you what's going to happen this year in the game. You're not going to be hearing about kids enrolling in school and taking on new jobs. You're going to be hearing about young people quitting jobs and stepping out of school to answer the call to take the world for Jesus. You know why we have to do it? Because the world's not getting any better. Did you hear the president's speech last night? The need is, 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 is greater than ever in our country. Opioid addiction, drug addiction, men, men and women get thrown into prison. I walked in tonight. I was so blessed. In fact, the last two weeks, I've been walking in, meeting guys that are coming to our church straight out of the joint. Come on, man. Yeah. I met a young man. He might be here tonight, Brian. And uh, walked in, didn't even get in the building yet. They said, I want to introduce you to Brian, Pastor. He's, he's been coming to our church. He did 17 years and just got out of Soledad. He told me that when he came here, he's been looking at different churches, invited to other churches. But when he came here for the first time, he felt something that he never felt anywhere else. Oh, some of you need to wake up here tonight. You don't even know. You know what I'm talking about. Come on, get behind your preacher. He felt something. He, you know what he felt? He felt the anointing that's on the ministry of Victory Outreach that you may, you, you may get out of prison, you may get out of the neighborhood, but the minute you step on the scene, you know that you are home. Can I hear an amen? Is there not a cause? The second thing every army needs is training and preparation. Write that down. Here's the question you have to ask yourself tonight is, what are you doing to be, to, what are you doing in your life to be prepared? Come on. If God's called you, he's chosen you. You say, well, I come to church on Sunday. I came, I came to tell you, friend, coming to church on Sunday is not enough. That's right. That's right. Come on. I can't guarantee, if you come to church on Sunday or on Wednesday night, I can't guarantee that you'll grow. That's right. I know God can speak to you, but I can't promise you you will grow. Come on, you, you've got to be intentional about getting yourself trained. Can I hear an Amen. You, you, you've got to ask yourself, what am I doing to prepare myself for spiritual battle? That's right. What am I doing to be equipped for the ministry? Yeah. I thank God that we have the UTC. I thank God that we now have the MTC. I thank yeah. God that we have VETI. Many of you are involved in VETI. Many of you have been yeah. to the training center. Many yeah. of you are, are even preparing your heart to go to MTC. I thank God for all these tools. I thank God for our discipleship home. I thank God for our men's home. But here's my mentality. Yeah. Amen, amen. I know you guys are excited. <laughs> they're, they're ready at all times. They're a good army. These guys are being prepared. But here's the question. Are we just delegating discipleship to those ministries? Or does God want to use you to raise up a soldier? Does God want to use you to disciple a young man? Does God want to use you to disciple a young woman? Or you get someone come and say, just send them to the home, send them to the training center, send them to the UTC, get involved in the life. Oh, no, no, no. You can't chuck the responsibility. God wants to use you. God wants to anoint you. God wants to put his spirit on you. Some of you won't clap. Don't clap, but hopefully by the end of the message, you'll catch this. See, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to take a look, not just at the UTC and all these other things. They're wonderful things. I mean, I'm, 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 Neutrogena's DNA is in those things. Yeah. But what are we doing locally? Yeah. What are we doing locally to raise up leaders? On, what are we doing locally to begin to see an army begin to rise up for the glory of God? We need preparation and training. What's the third thing every army needs? This is a powerful one here. You're going to like this. You liking this message or are you mad at me? If you're mad at me, then email Chris. Amen. It's his fault. <laughs> you know what the third thing every army needs? Watch this. Number three, leaders on the front lines. Yeah. Yeah. We got the cause. We got the preparation. But you know, every army needs those spiritual Marines. Yeah. I know we got Navy people here. Don't get mad at me now. <laughs> but who are the Marines? They're the ones that go in first. Yeah. Okay, we need some spiritual Navy SEALs. Come on, Come on, somebody. Where's my Navy people at? We need some people that are going to be willing to go on the front lines. See, here's my question, and I've been thinking about this a lot. Is this too much for you today? Who can this generation look to? Because I know that when we were coming up, we had people to look to. We looked at our pastors, Pastor Sergio. We looked at men like Pastor Ed Morales. We looked at men like Pastor Steve Pineda. We had men and women to look to 
who are laying their life down on the front lines. But here's my question. As they've gone on to be with the Lord, who are those hundred young people upstairs looking to in this room? Mm, you don't want to say nothing. Who are they looking to? Who's willing to go to the front lines? Who's willing to, to lay their life down for what they believe? See, we were so grateful because we, we were able to point to celebrate those who had went out. We, were, we learned to celebrate. We, we were excited to celebrate those who were willing to uproot, those who were willing to leave their hometown, those who were willing to leave their city, those who were willing to leave the comforts of their home, and they were willing to sacrifice and go out and do what the Lord had called them to do. Let me tell you something. It is a sacrifice. There's days when I'm even in this beautiful city and we have a beautiful, I thank God. Oh God, I'll get to that in a minute. But listen, <laughs> there's days when I'm driving down the road and sometimes I say, man, God, why didn't you call me to my city? I have friends in the ministry that they've been doing the ministry their whole life in their hometown. They got called just to go up the street. It's five minutes away. <laughs> have a church. It's 10 minutes from your house. They could leave 10 minutes from the house and get there in time for church and walk in and praise God. But me and Georgina have always been willing to leave the comforts of home behind. When we were young, young age, we, we were willing to uproot. We left all of our friends. We left everybody, went to the ugliest city in America. <laughs> and I, ha I have no shame in saying that. I lived there for four years. Bridgeport is ugly. <laughs> prettier now, I don't worry, but it was ugly then. Right, Marcia? You know, it's not an insult, it just is. <laughs> and it's cold. It's bone-chilling cold. Maybe that's why the Lord gave me a beautiful city like San Diego, because I paid the price. But where is that new generation of people that are willing to get out of San Diego? Willing to uproot from their community, uproot from their family, uproot from their comforts, and answer the call of God to go to the front lines. I declare to you tonight, there are people in this church that within the next two years, you will find yourself in Panama. You will find yourself in Europe. You will find yourself in South Africa. You will find yourself in the East Coast because God is raising up an arm. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching in this place. Tell your neighbor, get your house in order. So the fourth thing is mobilization. You know why the United States military is the most powerful military in the world? <coughs> you want to know why we are the only world superpower? It's because the United States of America has over 800 forward military positions around the world, 800. And the mentality of the US military is this, we can spring into action and be anywhere in the world in 30 minutes. That's right. Come on, come on somebody. Right. And when we come, we're bringing the heat. Wow. When we come, yeah. we're not coming to lose, we are coming to win the war. Come on, somebody. That's the calling on the Ministry of Victory Outreach. We're going to begin to raise up soldiers. We're going to begin to raise up bases. We're going to begin to raise up a generation that you're willing to leave your city and you're going to go into Europe and plant yourself. You're going to go into Latin America and plant yourself. You're going to come on, somebody. You're going to go and let the Lord use you in a mighty way. So isn't this powerful? This is our calling. If you ever said, well, Pastor, what are you thinking about this year? What's the vision? I just gave it to you. <laughs> Pastor, what are we going to do this year? <laughs> just gave you what we're going to do this year. We're going to get you ready. We're going to get you ready. 
We're going to raise up an army out of San Diego. Come on, we're going to raise up an army out of this county. We're going to raise up an army out of this ultra, uh, multi-region. Come on, somebody. And if you don't want to be in the army, you can go ahead and live that boring Christian life. But I'm looking for some of you that are ready to answer the call of God. You're not trying to be a regular Christian. You're not trying to be a, a Sunday Christian. You're not trying to be a Wednesday night church hopping Christian. You say, I am in the army of God. I am a son and daughter of the ministry of victory outreach the calling and the anointing to reach the inner cities rest upon my life look at your neighbor and tell them that's what we're doing this year you caught it good so what, what how do we raise up the right leaders can I give you a few more things we have the three S's Number one, write this down. <coughs> to raise up right, the right leaders for the vision, number one, is we need a spirit of sacrifice. Oh. You say, oh, we paid off our building. We made history. Yeah, we made history, but we're not history. Yeah. And let me say something to this church. If you stop sacrificing, you'll be history. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't like it. Uh, I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. If you, if you stop sacrificing, you'll be history. Yeah. That's right. I don't know about you. I don't want to be history. I want to make history for the Lord. I want to make an impact for the Lord. We need a spirit of sacrifice. We cannot transmit what we are not. We cannot give what we don't possess. We cannot take people to a place we have not been willing to go ourselves. You know, I feel like a lot of young leaders really need to be introduced to s -s 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 sacrifice. You can't even say it. <laughs> Let me introduce you to a very important person in your life by the name of sacrifice. <laughs> because many of our young leaders are falling into position and title, but they're not willing to do the required work to build a large ministry. I don't normally talk about church growth to you, but I will tonight. If you want to build a large ministry and have a mega church, like some of you have been saying, Pastor Dean, we're going to do a mega church. We're going to do big things. And you know what? You're going to have to be willing to sacrifice to get it to be a part. We need to be able to see this quality in our young leaders and even some of our uh, retired leaders to spring up again. God hasn't called you to retire. He's called you to refine Here's the key word. Work. Work for the Lord. Don't give Pharaoh your best. And give God your leftovers. Give God your best. And he'll take care of Pharaoh. Can I hear an amen? Someone say work. You see, Effective leadership requires late hours and long days. Oh, come, on. come on, somebody. Some of the ladies were here last night. This is Julie coming to town. Come on, somebody. Yeah. You're probably crashing in this service because you, you have such a caffeine dump right now. You've been <laughs> drinking Red Bulls and Rock Stars for 24 hours. You yeah, can't even praise the Lord right now. I, forg I forgive you. Requires long days and late hours. But how many know when you're working for the Lord, there's, jo there's joy involved in working for the Lord? And I've learned this, is that effective leadership requires a pace that outruns the people you're trying to lead. Should I say it again? Effective ministry requires a pace that outruns the people you're trying to lead. You can't lead a ministry from your house. You can't lead a ministry from your bedroom. You can't go from the pillow to the pulpit. You got to get your lazy blessed assurance up and you've got to begin to work and you've got to work for the Lord and you've got to give your best. Is there anybody here today that recognizes that if we're going to reach our destiny, we need leaders that are willing to work? Some of you are mad at me. 
like that. That's why you're not blessed. Because you have a government check mentality. You thought when Trump got elected, they were going to take away your Obama phone. They let you keep that. But if you're going to be blessed, then you got to put your hand to the plow. Oh, come on, somebody. You got to rise up in this place. This is your year to sacrifice. This is your year to work it. You got to do like that singer said. You better work, 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 work. Just work it. Tell your neighbor, you got to work it. You got to work it. One thing I've learned is this. Watch this. Wherever my energy flows, grows. Wherever my energy flows, grows. Wherever I give my best energy, that's what, where, where growth takes place. Wherever I water, come on, the, the grass is green where I water it. And this is the year where you got to get that spiritual water hose. And you got to say, okay, God, what are you saying to me in prayer? What do you want to give me this year in prayer? And you got to begin to water that vision. You got to begin to water that seed. You got to begin to water that disciple. You got to begin to water that life group. You got to begin to water that discipleship. Oh, come on, somebody. You got to begin to. Why is the men's home rocking? Because Johnny and Lisa have been watering the home. went this week, right, Johnny? You know what we went to look for? And we found one. And I don't know if he has a word yet, but we'll talk after. We're getting a ranch for the home. We're getting a ranch, baby. Victory Outreach San Diego is gonna have a men's homes ranch. I'll tell you about it later. Someone say sacrifice. I just feel this is important. Is this why we take the limits off tonight? Some of you are getting your break. You just got your breakthrough about two minutes ago. Someone say sacrifice. God's attracted to sacrifice. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. God says, where's my sacrifice? You want my presence? Where's my sacrifice? You want my blessing? Where's my sacrifice? You want my healing? Where's my sacrifice? You say, that's works. No, no, no. It's, it, 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 it's a spirit. It's an attitude. You sacrifice to the Lord. God is attracted to sacrifice. Yeah. God is attracted yeah. to those yeah. who are trying. God is attracted to those who get out of their comfort zone. God, come on, somebody. God helps those people that are trying. The fire falls on people who are trying. Come on, somebody. And we need some leaders in this place that you're willing to try and you're willing to try again. Yeah. I thank God. For somebody who sacrificed for me. I mentioned our founders who sacrificed for me. Laid their life down for all of us. How many of they really sacrificed? And I could tell you stories, I won't do it, but just stories that would cause you to just break. The sacrifices they made for this ministry. But I also thank God for simple lay people that also sacrificed. You saw in the video of Joey Del Rio, and some of you don't know him. When I first got saved, he, he really taught me how to pray, taught me how to get into the presence of God, taught me how to love, taught me how to be normal. I was so weird. <laughs> Still weird. <laughs> but I'm comfortable with my weirdness at this point. <laughs> I've accepted it. <laughs> taught me how to tap into God. I said, I need someone to work with me. Joey, he goes, I'll work with you, but you got to be willing to do one thing. He says, you got to be able to meet with me at five in the morning. Five? What? God's not going to be up at five in the morning. He says, I'm going to be driving in from La Puente all the way to Monterey Park. That's a good 20 miles. And then from there, I'm going to work. He says, I just want you to have the call from God. And man, I'll be honest with you, man. I couldn't get up at five, Rebecca. It was hard. <laughs> I thank God for a mom that even though she wasn't saved, she always woke up early. And I'd wake up to the smell of coffee. She wasn't even saved. But she knew God was doing a work in her son. She knew that work was real. She put that coffee on, and I would smell it. I said, oh, my God, Joey's going to be here any minute. And I'd always be the one to open the door, and I'd be like, hey, Joey. And he'd be like, What's up, bro? Come on, man. Let's get down. Let's get down to prayer, brother. Come on, let's go. And he would pray, and I could only pray for five minutes. But he was 
pray. This guy was a pro. He goes, oh, yeah, Pastor Josh, I need to pray, man. And I'd be five minutes already done. I'd get up. I'd look at him. <laughs> and he'd still be going in, like, I pray for Pastor Isaac. I pray for Mondo. I pray for that. And he's just going down the whole line, praying for every, praying for the dog, the cat, the birds, the, <laughs> the squirrels. <laughs> I'd just be looking at him like, <laughs> but I'm here today. Because people didn't give up on me. Come on, somebody. How many are grateful for the people that sacrificed? How many are grateful for the people that paid a price to get you here? Come on. How many are grateful for the people that prayed you in? Come on up, Matthew. How many are grateful for the people that were willing to, to deal with your stuff? They saw something in us that we could not see in ourselves. And how many could just take a moment? to praise God for a spirit of sacrifice that got us to where we are today. Come on, I want to give you an opportunity. I'm almost done. Come on, I want want you to really thank him right now. Hallelujah. Because the second thing that raises up leaders is not only a spirit of sacrifice, but watch this. It's the spirit of discipleship. Let me say something to you that want disciples. Let me say something to you, life group leader. Let me say something to you, to pastors, maybe watching online or you tune in from time to time. You want a big ministry. You want God to bless you. Listen, brother, you ain't going to have no disciples until you first sacrifice. What's Sister Julie doing here? What's she even doing here today? What is she even doing? Learning from us? You kidding me? Come on, Sister Julie. What could we teach you? It's not that. It's the fact that she's sacrificing to teach eight women sitting behind her. Just flew in from Panama. Worked hard all week. Deserves a day off. Day of rest. Day to just refuel. She doesn't do that. Because she became well acquainted with the spirit of sacrifice. And that's why she has spiritual sons and daughters by the thousands all over the world. And and if you think it's about coffee and tacos, you missed it. You you, you don't get to go on the next trip. You're going to stay home. Because the only way to get disciples, the spirit of discipleship in the church is through a spirit of sacrifice. It's when our leaders rise up in a spirit of sacrifice. It's when our leaders get home from work. You've been working all day. You're sweaty. Come on, somebody. Your wife made some food. She sacrificed. I sacrificed them in this meal, but you just eat like a little taste. You get ready for those people to come in to hear the word of God. Come on, somebody. And you don't give them your leftovers, baby. You give them your best because you've been prepared and you've been in prayer. Oh, come on, somebody. And that's when the Lord will give you disciples and that's when the Lord will give you an army and that's when we'll raise up soldiers out of this church and that's when we'll reach the world for Jesus. The spirit of discipleship is alive in this church. Isn't it alive? Isn't it alive? And that's the, I want you to stand. I feel done. I'm done. Did you, did you receive it? Can you thank God for the word? I know some of you are like, wow, that was, but come on, who really caught it? Boom. third S is the spirit filled strategic plan we're not listen to me I want you to hear this part very important very important here in our church we're not developing programs we're developing pathways programs will not make disciples but we want to develop pathways where we can see people who have the spirit of sacrifice, who have the vision of our ministry, could go 
towards the vision step by step by step by step by step. And we need it to be fast. It's taking too long. We have to move quicker. Look at Jamie and tell them we have to move quicker. No, tell them. Look at them. We have to move quicker. You know how long it took for me to get sent to Bridgeport? You know how long it took for me to get to sent to Bridgeport? Four years. Got saved all weird. You saw me with the torch. I was like, come on, how weird was I? Was I weird? Those dumb pants I had on. Weird hair. I went from that guy. Someone believed in me. A lot of rebukes. A lot of chop. To this guy. To this guy. I remember being at the altar one day in the mother church in the multiverse on a service just like this, on a regular midweek routine service. At the altar, on the side. And Pastor Sonny was in the front that day. He happened to be, you know, we would sit in the back on those midweeks. And he was in the front that day and he came up and he took his big old hands and put it on my shoulders, squeezed my shoulders real tight. And he don't, he didn't pray long. It was just like heavy. And he said, make him into a general. Wow. I don't know if Eugenia's ever been there before. Have you ever said that? And I felt it. Like, whoa, it was heavy. Like, I felt the power of God so strong. It chills through my whole body. And then a warmth. And he just came behind me. And then, you know, just shocked me and said, make him into a general. So we're in Mexico, and they call us up. These are going to be the new elders. So if you see me on the video, I was looking fidgety, huh? And they came up, and they got down. And the minute I stood there, I went all the way back <laughs> to that prayer. to start sacrificing again. And if this message spoke to you, and you say, Pastor, I want to be a part of that army. I feel God was in that word for me. I want you to come on up and spend some time at the altar right now.